let's start talking about one of our first topics, and that is internet architecture. And I, I want to. I want to think specifically about the internet and how it relates to the web. So my assumption coming into this course is that you all, all the people in the course, you have varying degrees of experience working with the web. I know that all of you have worked with the web. Let's be honest. You, you're, you're using the web right now. Um, you know, you're watching a video on YouTube, you're reading the course notes, there's no way that I'm going to tell you something about the web and none of you have ever heard of it before. The web is everywhere. The web is part of how we learn, how we shop, how we do everything, especially now in an era where, you know, we're having to be online with COVID. Uh, the web is the fundamental architecture that underlies e-commerce, education, government, you name it. So I'm not going to try and talk about the internet as a whole. But what I want to do is I want to introduce some of the important concepts of the internet and the web and how they're going to relate to the way that we think about writing the programs. So when you're building anything for the web, the network and the internet are a part of your program. The, the architecture and the design of how you build your applications is fundamentally derived from the fact that we have a global platform and we have the ability to connect resources, to link resources from all over the internet into a single program. And we can do this without permission. We can do this at runtime. And it's just an unbelievable set of capabilities. And if you understand how to, how to use them and you understand what's going on underneath, you're going to be able to do some amazing things. So I I'm going to lay this next to another model, which has become really popular recently, and that is thinking about apps on a mobile phone. So think about app stores and the way that mobile phones work. And we're going to play these off of each other because they're very, very different concepts. And there are huge implications to the ways that they work. And uh, the web is unique in the way that it solves a number of the problems that we're going we're gonna to be talking about. So every, just about every device you use runs the web. I was interested this, this summer uh, if you saw the launch of um, SpaceX put their, the, the, the Dragon um, crewed spaceship went up to the International Space Station. And it was interesting because their entire cockpit instrumentation panel is all written in uh, web technology. So this right here is the web. Uh, you know, when, they, when they're working with their spaceship and interacting with the panel. So not only is the web everywhere on Earth, but the web is also in space. Um, your, your laptop, your phone, your video game console, your car, your, your fridge, I mean, everything, uh, your router, all of it is connected to what we're going to be talking about here. So I've got some links in the notes this week to, you know, some really good overviews about how the internet and the web work. And I would ask that you start there. And in fact, I'm assuming that you've already read through these notes before we, we meet. So what I'd like you to do is if you haven't read through these, make sure, you know, pause the video and go, go and study the notes first so that we can talk about them rather than me trying to teach you. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything that's in the list here, but I do want to talk about IP addresses and domain names and HTTP and etc. I want to show you examples. And instead of giving you a bunch of slides, I'm going to do a bunch of live examples. I'm going to use, um, use my terminal and my browser to show you some examples. But we'll start out with, with this pair here. So here we have Tim Berners-Lee on the left and Vint Cerf on the right. And they're sort of wearing these joke shirts because Tim Berners-Lee did invent the web and Vint Cerf did invent the internet, but they get confused and the internet and the web get confused as well. So when we're talking about the web, the web is a series of open protocols and open standards that run on top of the internet. So the internet is this connected network, this global network that allows every computer on the planet to be connected and to exchange data. And the web is a set of protocols that those machines are speaking to each other in order to exchange data. And they're doing so, they're exchanging hypertext in order to make what we're gonna talk about as the web work. 
So let's talk about how these things work and um, some of the significant aspects of it. So the first thing to note is that the internet relies on distributed resources and those resources get connected via URLs. So when we talk about a URL, a URL is a, re a uniform resource locator. It's a name that we give to a thing, an address that we give to a thing on the network, on the web, that allows us to link to it. And so any given web page can link to resources that are from the same computer, but also from other computers all over the world, literally all over the world. So when we are building web applications, we are connecting or we're linking URLs to scripts, images, videos, audio, etc., that can be all put in different locations. This is very different when we think about working with um, apps on an app store. What we're talking about there is downloading a bundle, taking all of those separate resources that you would have had that are all spread out over the web and putting them all together into one binary and then downloading that binary. So one of the advantages that an app store has from the standpoint of a company is that you have a central control. So you have Google or you have Apple and they get to say who is allowed to publish those binary uh, apps on their store. They are allowed to charge for them. They're allowed to remove them if they want to. They're allowed to advertise them, block them, whatever they want. They're in complete control when they're doing this. The web is really different. The web is this permissionless system, this platform that allows anyone, including you, including me, to create some new resource on the network and connect it to other resources that are on the network as well. No one is in charge of this. No one says you can or you can't. Um, there aren't the same kinds of gatekeepers that are making it so that software does or doesn't get put onto the internet. So this requires the web to have a lot of security built into it in order to keep people safe because obviously just having anyone be able to put any code anywhere is, is a dangerous idea and we'll talk about how browsers achieve this. But what it means is that people use the web more than any other platform that there is. Like, so let me ask you a question right now. How many apps have you installed on your phone this week? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up a number. Tell me how close I am. What do you think? Zero? That's how many I've installed on my phone this week, this month, probably this year. How many apps do you use on your phone? I mean, you obviously do use them. I use all kinds of apps on my phone. I have, you know, 10 or 20 apps on my home screen, and I have a few on my secondary pages that I go through, and I'll use those apps every now and again, but I basically live in probably half a dozen apps, and that's it. That's really what I do on my phone. How many websites did you go to this week? Think about that question for a second. I can't even count. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Every time I was searching for anything, every time I was doing something for entertainment, something for my work, something for learning, I was gonna cook a recipe, I needed to buy something. All of that went through different websites. So when you think about the ease with which we can install something from the internet, all I need to do is I need to go to the address and now I'm running that code. So this is such a powerful idea. The deployment model, the installation model of the internet is that we visit a resource on the network and then download all of the things that we need in order to make that work. Powerful, powerful idea for being able to distribute software. And it's because it's so easy to do it, people have done it for absolutely everything you can think of and new websites get added all the time to the internet. Think, I mean, everything is available as a website, but you know, the app model has been popular too, but for a very different reason, because of control. And the web, the web doesn't enforce the same kind of control. No one is in charge of the web. The web isn't owned by a company. The web isn't an Apple technology or a Google technology, even though both of them would probably love to be able to claim it. But the web is this shared resource that all of us can participate in, that we can, be, we can build things for, we can publish to, we can use, etc. Fundamental ideas. Okay, so the web is a set of standards that run on top of the internet. So 
and we said that these resources are all linked with URLs. So let me let me show you what I mean. Let's talk about what um, what some of this means. So right here we have a URL, and this URL, if I were to visit it, is this page right here. This is the course outline that um, for Web two two two. And again, with URLs, maybe you already know a lot about how these things work, but I want to. I want to take you through what's actually in a URL so that you can understand when we start talking about them, when we start programming with them, what's important, what's significant to this. All right, so when I look at this URL, the first thing that I notice is I notice the protocol. So the protocol for this particular resource is HTTPS. So you're going to be familiar with HTTP and HTTPS protocols. Let's see what happens if I here, if I type HTTP instead of HTTPS, and I try and load this, what, what has it done? It's it sent me to the HTTPS, the secure version of this. So let's talk about this for a second. What's going on when you have a secure connection like this? So I'm gonna just change views here for a second so I can write some code over here. So I wanted to show you between my computer that I'm sitting on right now and Google, I'm going to run a trace route. And what it's going to do is it's going to show me every computer that I'm going to go through between this computer that I'm sitting at and the eventual computer that I'm going to be getting to inside of uh, Google's network. And you can see that there's nine different hops that I'm going to go across. So in other words, in order for me to get to Google, it's not like I am directly connected to Google. I'm gonna bounce around the internet from one machine to another until I get to the, the correct machine that I want to communicate with. So when I do this with HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, we're gonna talk about what HTTP looks like in a second, but HTTP is the language or the protocol that my computer is going to speak in order to talk to the other computer, in this case, Google. When you're going across the internet, you are sending text from your computer to a remote computer, and it's going across the internet, and any of the computers that are in the middle of this, so any of these computers are in between me and the other end. So they are receiving my data and sending it along, they're routing it on to the next set of computers. So the, this is what the internet is. It's a giant network of networks. So do I trust all of these computers between me and other parts of the internet? The answer is, I don't even know who most of them are. Uh, some of them are my ISP. Some of them are gonna be the ISP for the remote machine, but they could be any number of people, including hackers. There could be computers that are sitting, compromised machines that are sitting in the middle of this that are gonna be problematic. So, what I want to be able to do is I, I want to be able to trust the data that I'm sending from here to the other endpoint. I want to make sure that it doesn't get tampered with. It doesn't get viewed by anyone else in between the two of us. And so if we use HTTPS, the secure version of the HTTP protocol, then what's going to happen is encryption is going to happen between my machine and the remote machine such that none of the other machines in between the two of us are, are, are they're not able to read the data. The data is gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna share the data. It's gonna go across that link, but it's not gonna be intelligible to anyone except for the client and the server that are communicating to each other. Okay, so the first thing we have is we have a protocol. The next thing that we have after the colon slash slash is we have a domain. So the domain for this, I can't highlight it very well, but you can see here is ict.senecacollege.ca. So the domain name is a human readable name for a particular machine on the internet. And if we want to, we could look up what this, what any of these uh, domain names are. So if, again, if I were to go back into my terminal, I can look and see what a particular domain name resolves to, which IP address it is using the nslookup command. So I could say nslookup google.com. And what it tells me is that using this DNS server, it has given me this IP address. So google.com 
is this machine right here. So in theory, I should be able to ping google.com like this, or I should be able to ping 172.217.165.14, and both of them will work. So Google's a huge network of machines, and there's various machines that will respond when you ask it to um, go to google.com. So here I'm sending a little bit of network traffic over to that machine across the internet. But in both cases, I'm able to work with it. I can either use the IP address. So this IP address, if you look at the format of it, we've got one, two, three, four portions. And because you've been learning C and C++, you think about what is this? Well, this is a number from 0 to 255, 0 to 255, 0 to 255, 0 to 255. And so if you think about what is that if you're programming, I've got a byte, a byte, a byte, and a byte. So I have four bytes. So I have 32-bit number is really what an IP address is. It's an address space, 32 bits of information, and these are all of the different machines that are available on the network. There's also, so this is called IPv4. There's also a version of the IP protocol v6, which uses 128 bits. So it has room for more devices and more uh, machines. And so there's efforts to transition from IPv4 to IPv6. So when I'm talking about working with a um, domain, I can, I can always substitute the IP address for the domain. Um, as a human, I'm gonna prefer the domain most of the time. And DNS servers are gonna help me to look up this information. So the, the internet stores these, uh, they're like phone books really, that allow you to say, I wanna go into google.com or twitter.com or whatever it is, and I need to know which computer is currently attached to that address. The other thing about this is just like a cell phone number that you would get, it's possible for you to have somebody else's cell phone number. So somebody stops their plan and the cell phone number that they used to have goes back into circulation, you get a new plan, you now have that number. So these numbers are reusable, IP addresses are reusable, and so different sets of numbers, um, that, you know, they'll be attached to a particular um, to a particular network. So if I look up, for example, uh, ict.seneca, what is my address that I'm, Seneca College CA, you can see we get 142, 204, 165, 167. So what do we have? We have a protocol, we have a computer. So this is the language we want to speak, HTTPS. This is the computer that we want to talk to, ictsenecacollege.ca, which maps to a particular um, IP address. Okay, good so far. The next part that is not currently visible, but right here is the port number. So the port number is a number uh, between one and 65,000, um, it's a 16-bit integer, and unsigned 16-bit integer, and it is a particular port, almost like uh, an extension on a phone. So when I call into a company and I say, you know, I, I call into Seneca and I say I want extension 3046, and they transfer me to extension 3046. That's what a port number is. So when you have a URL like um, HTTPS, uh, google.com if you if you were doing http the default port is port 80 and so we typically don't write it if it's the default port so if i leave the default port off it means 80 when the protocol is http or if i was doing https the default protocol default port for that protocol is 443 but you're also going to see lots of times where people are going to write their own they'll write numbers like this. You are going to write lots of web servers over the coming uh, weeks and months when you're working on different web courses, and you'll need to run your own little web servers on uh, your local computer. So one of the things I could do is I could run, I could run using a special, 
a special name instead of google.com, I could say localhost. Localhost means this computer, the machine that I'm on right now. Or if I wanted to, I could use an IP address 127.0.0.1 means this computer, this particular machine that I'm on right now. Okay. So we have a protocol, we have a domain, and we have a port. Now, when you have those three things, you have what's known as an origin. Origins are incredibly important for web programming. It's really important for you to understand, uh, understand what we're talking about here. So if I, let, let me back up for one second. If I sent you uh, an email and it had an exe in it, and I said, double click on this exe, run this file, would you do it? No. <laughs> you, if you would, don't do it. Don't trust me. Don't trust anybody. If somebody emails you a executable file, there's no way you're going to trust some random thing. Or you're in uh, the library and there's a USB key sitting on the on the desk and you look on it and it has an executable and you think, oh, I'll just put it in my computer and I'll run it. No, you obviously wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't you do that? You don't want to run untrusted code on your computer because you don't want it to access your files. You don't want it to install things. You don't want it to put a virus or malware or encrypt your, your hard drive, um, et cetera. Now, let me ask you another question. What if I sent you an email with a URL in it? Would you click that? Would you go to a random URL that you saw printed on the side of a poster? Or if somebody in the library said, um, this is my homepage, uh, if you want to read my blog, you can go to this URL, would you go to it? Probably you would. I'm going to give you hundreds and hundreds of URLs in this course that you don't know where they go. There's going to be lots of links on the web. You're just going to click on a link and you're going to go somewhere. How come you trust your web browser to go to these places, but you wouldn't trust an executable to run on your computer. The reason is that the web has very sophisticated security mechanisms built into it, and it sandboxes all of these applications that it runs on your computer. So when I go to google.com and it runs a whole bunch of code, which it does, it gets isolated from everything else on my computer. It's allowed to run, but it's only given restricted access to my computer. It can't read my hard drive. It can't talk to um, other programs running on my computer. It can't install software, those kinds of things. How does a browser, how does the web figure out what to trust with, you know, which, which pieces of code to trust and which pieces of code not to trust? So the answer to this is that web browsers and the web they, they use a security model known as the origin or same origin uh, policy. So what is an origin? An origin is the protocol, the domain, and the port. Those three things together, those three things make up the origin. So in this case, this is an origin right here, and this would be port 443. So a web browser says, I am going to allow code or I'm going to allow certain things to happen for anything that's from this origin, but things that are from other origins, from third parties, I'm not going to allow them to mix. So right now I have the ICT web page open over here and I have the web222.ca uh, web page open in another tab. I have two different tabs open. These two pages cannot talk to each other. They don't have any channel between them that would allow them to communicate because they don't share the same origin. So the browser is intelligent that way. If I opened up another tab, if I had this and I put it into another tab, now I have two of these tabs. These two web pages could communicate with each other. They could share things with each other because they are both using the same origin. So this is a really important idea to understand when you're looking at URLs and you're thinking about how security works, especially as a programmer, and where you're going to host certain pieces of information. Origin-based security is the backbone of how the web, the web functions. All right. 
So let's keep going through our URL uh, discussion here. So we got up to this point right here. The next thing that we have in this URL is a thing that looks like this. It starts here at the slash and it goes, it goes up to the question mark. So this, if you look at it, what does it look like? Well, to me, it looks like a Unix file path. And that's really what it is. It is a path name into the particular computer that you're communicating with. So it looks like a POSIX or a Unix style file system path. So it's, it's a path that may or may not map directly to the remote server's file system. So this doesn't say that I'm going to the course directory and then I'm going to this. It, it, could, be, it could mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. This server is going to expose all of its resources as a set of paths that you can access. So I can specify things as though they were files and I can request them. I can say, please give me this, or I can post things there. I can, I can interact with the server and say, I want to push or pull things up or down from, the, from that server. Okay, the next thing that we see here is the query string. Query string starts with a question mark and then it has key value pairs that go on it. So in this case, you can see I have a key of Q and then I have a value of course equals web 222, okay? And if I had multiple, multiple items here, I would separate them with ampersands. So these are extra variables, really. These are additional parameters that you want to send to the web server so that when it executes your request, it also takes into account this information right here. All right, so another thing that's important to note about how these URLs work is you're limited in the characters that you can include. So for example, you can't put spaces in a URL. Uh, you can't put spaces, you can't put Unicode characters or emojis or all sorts of things like that. Anything, any special characters have to be encoded. And we'll be talking about what encoding uh, encoded looks like. But if I do a Google search, um, you know, for say, if I do a search for cat, my um, address bar, let me just copy this so you can see it, so it's bigger. My address looks like this. Let me go back here. So I'm at HTTPS www.google.ca search, and then I have the query string, and then it says, um, safe equals active, ampersand, SXFR equals, and it goes on and on and on. But then notice this right here. So you can see that anytime there's a special character in a URL, what's gonna happen is it's gonna get encoded like so. So you're gonna see these percents. I'll see if I can find another one. Lots and lots of data on the URL here, but not a lot of it is encoded at least not encoded with URL encoding. So this was this one doesn't give us any more examples to see, but watch out for it. You're gonna see examples of this when you're looking at different pages. Okay, so let me, sh let me walk you through doing some things with HTTP and uh, URLs and requesting data from web servers and so on. And I'm going to do it, I'm going to use this page right here. I'm going to use the Wikipedia article on JavaScript. And I'm going to show you a couple of interesting things. So let me switch back again. Okay, so I'm going to use two different ways of interacting with the web here. The first is I'm going to use a program called curl. And if you haven't used curl before, Curl is a command line tool for working with URLs. So as a programmer, it's really useful because often you want to talk to a server via a URL, but you don't necessarily want to have to write a big program to do it. You just want to be able to hit some URL, send some data, get back some data, and do it from the command line. So Curl is an amazing tool for doing this. And obviously a web browser is another 
program which can work with URLs. I can type in a particular URL and get back this information. Okay, so let's walk, let's do a little walkthrough here. So let's say that I'm interested in working with, um, if I go to http wikipedia.org and I press enter. So I wanna show you what has happened when I do this. So over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say curl um, http wikipedia.org. So same idea, but I'm gonna do it at the command line here. And I get nothing back. So I'm gonna ask it to include the headers. I'm gonna do dash dash include headers. And I'm gonna get back a response that looks like this. So what you're seeing here on the right is you're seeing exactly what happened here on the left, but a number of steps have been hidden inside the browser. So the browser has done some things for us that aren't obvious. Okay, so the first thing that happened here was I requested this URL, http wikipedia.org, and the server gave me back the following response. So I want you to notice what this response looks like. It starts off and it says, this response is HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that's the language that we're seeing here, and it's version 1.1. And the first thing I get back is I get an HTTP status code. Let's just look these up. So if you go and look at the HTTP status codes, they go from 100 up to 599. And each one of these numbers means something. So if we go scrolling down in the list, we'll see that 301, right here, 301, means that this resource that you've requested has been moved permanently. It's been moved and it says the new URL is given in the response. So let's take a look at this. So I asked for HTTP wikipedia.org and the Wikipedia server responded and said, the resource you're looking for has moved, 301. And if I go looking down through the rest of the information, take a look at how this information is structured. So what I have here is I have a name, a colon, and then some information followed by a new line. Then I have a name, a colon, some information followed by a new line. So these things that you're seeing here, these are called the headers. So when a response comes back, we get these headers, and each one of these headers has a meaning. The one that I'm particularly interested in right now is down here at the bottom, and it looks like this. So it says location is https wikipedia.org. So think about this for a second. I asked for http wikipedia.org, so this is the non-secured open version of HTTP. And Wikipedia said to me, the resource you're looking for now lives at this URL, HTTPS. So remember a second ago, we said that origins take into account the protocol, the domain, and the port. So what it's really saying here is the information that you want has been moved to a new origin. It's now on a secure origin. It's on HTTPS. Okay, so let's do the same thing again. Let's go and, and change our request to add the S, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna, this time we're gonna ask for, for this, I'll just move it up. So here's what we get back. Okay, so take a look at what just happened. I get back HTTP version two. So there's multiple versions of the HTTP protocol. So it says this is HTTP version two and I get another 301. So what does 301 mean? Moved permanently. So this time it says, okay, the thing that you want has been moved and it says it's been moved to this location right here. And there's a whole bunch of other headers in here that tell me various things about the about the, the resource that I'm getting. But one of them that is in here that's kind of interesting is it tells me that 
there is some content in this response. So I made a request to the server and the server sent back a response and it tells me the type of the response that I'm giving you is text and more specifically, it is HTML. So this is an HTML page that came back to me. So look at this response. It starts like this and it has all of the headers. And then after that, there's a blank line. And then after the blank line, there is what's known as the body. So the response has a body. And in this case, the body is a web page. Now, because we're not working with a web browser, I'm using the command line and I'm using curl, this web page hasn't been rendered. It hasn't been turned into something that I can see. Instead, I've just been given a lot of raw HTML code. But take a look at this. Even though we don't know a lot of HTML, can you make sense of this? So what this thing says is I have HTML and it says 301 moved permanently. And it says the document has moved and it gives me another address. So let's try a third time to get this right. So what it's saying is if you want to look at this web page, you have to go to this URL right here. So I'm going to try it one more time. Curl HTTPS. Whoops, let's do it again. Curl HTTPS www.wikipedia.org and it's going to pull this down for me. So when I run this, I get back a huge HTML page and I'm not going to go through what all of this means today because we're going to be studying this throughout the entire course. But this thing that you're seeing here is what is shown here on, on the left. All of this code that I'm showing you here on the in my terminal is what has been rendered by my web browser. But all of the steps that were necessary to go from one website to another website to the third website where the actual data lived, all of that was hidden away inside of just asking for this one URL to be loaded. So let me, let me go back here for a second. I'm going to tell it to, I only want to see, let's say that I only want to see the headers. I don't want to see the rest of the body. So here's the final version of what I get back from Wikipedia and it says 200 is the result. So if we go and look up, what does a 200 mean? 200 is a success response and it means the request has succeeded. So I was able to get the, the web page that I wanted or the resource that I wanted and it's been sent to me and the server says, this thing that I'm giving you is HTML, it's text, but it, more specifically, it's HTML text, and it tells me a bunch of information about it, um, like when it was last modified and so on, and then all of the data comes afterwards. So this is the website that has been downloaded here that I'm looking at. Okay, so that's really interesting. So when we're working with a URL, we are making requests to a server from a client. So we when, when we're a client, a client could mean from the command line or it could mean inside of the web browser. And we're gonna be asking that the web server respond back and give us some particular resource, some particular URL. Okay, so let's, let's do a couple more things here. So here's the article on JavaScript. And I wanna show you just a couple more things before we, we pause on this, um, talking about um, URLs and HTTP and so on. I wanna show you some examples of working with this URL and adding some of the other parts that we were talking about before. So one of the things that we said we could do is we could add a query string. So if I add a question mark and I type, you know, name equals, web222 and I press enter, the page reloads. So the reason it reloads is because I have altered the URL and I've put extra information into the, into the query string of the URL. That gets sent back to the server and the server is going to respond back to me and say, okay, here's the resource that you're requesting. Now in this case, when I say name equals web222, it doesn't mean anything to the server. 
So I have to use something that would mean something to this particular server. Now, Wikipedia is interesting because you can actually ask for certain things from Wikipedia. So for example, if I wanted to edit this page, I could say action equals edit. So I'm gonna load the web page, but I'm gonna say action equals edit. And now it says, welcome to Wikipedia, and I can start editing this web page. And you can see here's the text of this web page right here. So if I wanted to um, make, a, make a correction, fix a typo, add some more information, I could. All because I clicked, or not I didn't click, but I used the URL to add information here. Um, another thing I could do is I could say, I want to use a particular skin, um, let's say the modern skin. So uh, Wikipedia has these different styles that you can render the, um, the page in. And they don't usually get turned on, but you can you can turn on these other these other styles. Or I could say, I want to see the history of all the edits to this page. So I say action equals history. So what I want you to notice is that I can change what I get back from a web server based on what's in the query string. The query string is a big part of what's going on uh, when you do when you do a search. Or like if I was if I was going to be on you know Google.com/search um, query equals dog. So if I wanted to look up dog on Google, the way that I pass it in is I would say Q equals dog. That Q equals dog is your query, the thing that you're passing to to Google. And you can see that now I'm doing a search for dogs. But if I ch if I changed this, you know, to horse, I'm going to get horse instead of dog, all because I'm changing what goes in the URL. So this query string is really powerful. It's a big part of what happens in the URL. We have the path name, but we also have these things that we can, they're configure, configuration parameters. It's almost like arguments to functions if you think about it as a programming thing. Okay, one last thing I want to mention here, and that is adding fragments. So look at this. If I scroll through this article and I get to the table of contents, so here's the table of contents, and if I click on one of these things like syntax, watch what it does. So it didn't reload my browser. Did you notice that? Let me do it again. So I'm going to go back to the top. I'm going to click on trademark. Did not reload the page. What did it do? Well, it moved me to a new location within the page. Now. Can you see what I have in my URL? So what it's done is it's added, oops, I got too much. It's added a hashtag and then it's added a fragment. So in this case, the fragment is trademark. Or if I went to, if I said syntax, like so, you can see that it's jumped me to a particular spot. So again, notice this, if I say, Syntax, if I do this with the query string, watch what happens. It reloaded the page. Did you notice that? So if I go here and I put a hash, it doesn't reload. It's not going to reload the page if I change this to something else. It just it sits on the same thing. The reason for that is when you have a query string and you say, you know, x equals y, that is part of the URL. Okay, so it's going to get sent to the server. It's going to get processed when the uh, when the server processes this request. When you say hashtag and then you give a fragment name, that fragment represents some ID in this page that you want to link to. So like for example, history. If I said uh, history, it would link me to history. What's nice about this is I could share this link with somebody. So if I open a new tab and I paste this in, when I go here, I'm now going to be automatically scrolled down to the history portion of the page. So a fragment on a URL tells the browser that you want to link inside of the resource. So the URL kind of stops here 
This is the URL that you're on, and the fragment is where inside of this resource you're going to be looking for something when you know when you go and look for it. So I wanted to I wanted to talk about all this because we're going to refer to URLs all the time. You're I'm going to talk about them uh, nonstop in this course and other courses because URLs are the way that we 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 address things on the web. So for you to really understand the pieces of a URL, for you to understand things like the protocol, the origin, how to work with ports, the difference between the query string and fragments in a URL, that's really important stuff. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this. I'll pause this here and we'll carry on with some um, talking about developer tools, browsers and so on, and JavaScript in follow-ups.